All right, we'll see if this works. All right, so Adam, you've been here before. Hello, welcome back. Uh, so Trishna, am I saying that? Is it, am I saying your name right? Yes, that's oh. right. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, are you Jewish? Uh, no, I'm not. But I am on the way. I am looking for uh, a way for confession. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. Uh, hopefully, some more people will join in. Um, but today, I just uh, wanted to con not make it so like content heavy not that my other ones were very content heavy but just to like uh kind of give it give a chizuk or, or like some encouragement or some uh strengthening for for you or for anyone who is not jewish and you know oops one second who's not jewish but you know is going to be participating, not participating, but you know, you have like Christian family members and uh, Kratzmach is coming up and listen, like I, you know, I know how it is. It, it takes a while for them to get used to the idea that you're not going to be like participating anymore or like you're not interested, you know, and I just think it's very appropriate and I, I kind of mentioned this last week uh, briefly. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that this is all happening uh in this time of year, uh, because this is, this is literally like a, a, a microcosm of the, uh, Hanukkah story, uh, for sure. And it has, even has what to do for non-Jews as well. And that, that's just kind of what I wanted to, uh, talk about real quick today. But, um, before that, does anybody have any specific questions or things that you wanted me to like talk about with regards to the holidays and stuff for Hanukkah or I mean there's so much so many things to talk about so if you know if you had an idea of like oh let's start here like I want to hear about this I I don't know if I don't mean to put you on the spot and if you're not comfortable answering no I, please do so it, please do for for someone in a position who say not Jewish right but say um respects and has an interest in it I know there's a line between what's appropriate and what's not. Would you think that um, <clears throat> having a, a, a menorah and, and trying to observe that, that I guess, mitzvah, um, would, is that appropriate or is that something over the line really only for Jewish people? Um, the way I see it is like the, you know, it, it's technically, according to the letter of the law, there's only like three things that a non-Jew cannot do, uh, and that's um, keep Shabbat. 100%. You can keep Shabbat 99%, you know, but just make sure you break it. Uh, especially if, if you're planning on converting, you know, obviously you need to learn the laws of Shabbat, but then how do you learn the laws of Shabbat if you can't practice it? Well, you practice it like 99%, and then, so by the time you are Jewish, you kind of know what's going on. And um, so you can't do that. You can't, al you can also can't wrap to fill in. I mean, I guess you could, but like nothing would happen, and you definitely can't say the the blessing on it because it would be a blessing in vain. You definitely can't do that, uh, and then you definitely can't, you know, have if you're a man, you can't have a a brit milah. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have the milah. It just means you can't have the brit, like <laughs> the covenant part. Like that's the part you can't have, because um, that is exclusive to the Jewish people. So th in theory, like in the halachic theory, uh, really anything else is fine. Like anything else a non-Jew could do, but it's just volunteer and you definitely can't say the blessing on it. Like if you wanted to light a menorah, I mean, it doesn't, right? It's not like on the level of those other things that I just mentioned. Like it's not on the level of like tefillin or Shabbat or Brit Milah, right? Um, it's like, first of all, not in the Torah, not, not to, that doesn't mean it's less important, God forbid, but it, it's just not, you know, at that level of uh, severity of like punishment, right? But, you know, there is just what's called derech eretz, which is just like the, the way you do things or like a, a good way to do things. I probably would not, you know, just because the whole, uh, the whole reason we light the menorah is to publicize the mitzvah, uh, or publicize the miracle, um, rather, 
that happened to the Jewish people specifically. Um, so I think, I, I don't know, like I probably wouldn't, you know, I probably would err on the side of caution and not do that. And that's not just for menorah, that's for like really anything else. Like, you know, even like technically like non-Jews, you know, are not explicitly prohibited from like wearing tzitzis, but like also you probably shouldn't do that because it's kind of like appropriation, you know, and, and if, if you want to be seen or like noticed as an ally of the Jewish people, that's like one thing you don't want to do is like try to, you know, co-opt with whatever they're doing because that's what the, that, that's what the notes room do, right? That's what the Christians do. They like, I don't know how many times I've been in the house, there's a big old honking Kratzmach tree and then there's like, oh, the little menorah in the window because Yashki was Jewish and it's all cute. We can all hold hands and smoke pot and sing songs. Like, no, like, <laughs> like that's not, it's not appropriate. Like you can't, can't be doing that. So um, like, obviously you're in a, you're not in that, you're not in that situation, but, but still like just formality wise or like respect wise, like I probably wouldn't, but I also can't say it's prohibited because that's probably not true. It's just, yeah. So that's what, that's my take. That's helpful input. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. But you know, by all means, like go to, you know, like I mentioned in the last, last week, like go to the events, go to the things and like there, I mean, if you look on uh, like Chabad's social media stuff, like they're, they're having menorah lightings all over the place, you know, in public. And, you know, if you start to make Jewish friends, you can go to their houses and stuff like that. And that'd be a great way to like show support. Yeah. So that's, that's basically it. Anything else? I love to uh, read Sidur. How about uh, is it is okay if I'm not comfortable yet? But I read Sidur and say Shema. Oh, that's a good question. You have to ask your Rav about that. I think um, the Shema is interesting because it doesn't contain anything like not true, right? Like it didn't. It's not saying anything that you wouldn't agree with. Um, but the nature of the Shema is like. It says Shema Yisrael, right? <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like, it, right. it, it's, it's, right, it's like, what is it? But the, the problem is, or not the problem, the, the tricky part comes in if you're converting. So that's why I said ask your Rav, because when you're converting, right, it says in the Gemara, it says in the Gemara about converts, like, Ger Shenit Gayer, which means a convert who converts. And the, if I'm not mistaken, the Chida, like, asks a really good question. Why does it say a convert, like, you know, why not a Goy who converts? Like, isn't that more accurate? Like, it's a, a non-Jew, like a Goy, and then he converts, right? He says, no. The truth is, everyone who decides to convert, like, their souls were at Mount Sinai, right? So, they were... In, in like a spiritual level, they were Jewish the whole time. It's just now in the third dimension, things are getting like sorted out. So that's why it's called Ger Shinit Gayer, a convert who converts, because they're not going, they're, they don't fall into the category. Um, so that begs the question, okay, like what then, like what's the deal with their mitzvahs? So in practice, this is what we do in practice, at least in my conversion course, they uh, pretty much ask you to keep the Torah 100 or like 99% with the exceptions of like the three things I mentioned. And then uh, that's how you learn. But because you, you are in a state of learning, you're in a stage of what's called, um, uh, what do you call it? Chinuch. Uh, Chinuch. It's funny because it, it has, it's kind of the, shares the same root word of, uh, of Hanukkah. Uh, which is interesting, but um, Chinuch is like it literally means uh, inauguration, and that's why that's why it's called Hanukkah because you're inaugurating the temple. But Chinuch is uh, basically when you're a young child and you're in a certain age group. You're before the age of uh, thirteen for a for a boy or twelve for a girl, and you're not obligated in the mitzvahs yet. You're you're still like a child, but you're learning like you have to learn the mitzvahs because soon you'll be an adult and like you can't just not know the mitzvahs, right? So there's a concept that you should train your children to do all the mitzvahs they need to do, including the like, 
you know, things that they're not going to really need to know until they're an adult. Because it's not like they just magically know everything, like you have to start practicing it. So the, the same exact thing applies to a convert. So if you're in a conversion class, you you really should be assuming that you're Jewish. Like, just assume that, like, you're Jewish. And, and don't tell yourself, like, oh, well, I'm not Jewish, so I, you know, I shouldn't do this. Like, no, you, you're, you're, like... If you're serious, like, if, you, if you're still on the fence, like, I don't know, like, I, I've never met you before, I've never spoken to you, so, like, that's up, that's kind of uh, something you have to decide for yourself, but if you're serious and you're like, no, I'm gonna do this, and you're already, like, halfway through, and you're gonna, you know what I mean, you're just, t like, waiting for the mikvah, you should be keeping everything, like, to the fullest extent possible, with the exception of the three things I mentioned, and, and that includes wearing tzitzis and everything, like, doing the whole bit, but if you're on the fence, and you're still trying to figure out if this is right for you. And you're you're still trying to like, you know, find your place. Um, that that is a little different because because then the question the it's still a question, like, are you really considered a convert? Like are you Gershanith Gayer? That's the question. But only you know that. Like that like no one can make that determination for you. That's just a conversation you have to have with yourself and like Hashem. <laughs> So if it, it really depends. But yeah, a ask your Rav. Like, whoever is converting you, whoever is, like, teaching you, uh, just do whatever they say, and you'll be fine. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Alright. Um, so I wanted to read a little bit from this book called Living Beyond Time by Rabbi Pincha Stop Stalper. It's an amazing book about all the holidays. Um, I just wanted to pick something out that it spoke about Hanukkah because it's really it really like highlights what what we're we're facing today. And there's like a little subsection called Hanukkah today, and basically, just I don't want to read like the whole entire thing, uh, but let me just read the first few paragraphs because it's just like really psh, hits the nail on the head. So it says, the miracle of Hanukkah repeats itself in each generation, in those days and at, the, at this time. The revival of Torah in our day is no less a miracle. The odds are no less formidable, and the faith and determination that is required is no less. The forces of Western civilization, which place materialism, secularism, and technology above spiritual Torah values, are Greek philosophy and modern dress. The adoption by masses of Jews of secular values and immoral lifestyles mimics the Hellenization of Jewish society in ancient times. Secular philosophy, which denies the uniqueness and supremacy of Torah and the reality of God's will, remains our greatest enemy. We sing in the Hanukkah hymn Mausu, Yevanim Nikbsu Alai. Nikbsu Alai. The Greeks, Greeks have overwhelmed me. This challenge describes the plight of the majority of Jews today. They are overwhelmed by the secular technological life around them, but if we can succeed in rekindling the light of authentic Judaism, as did the Maccabees, we too can succeed in replicating the miracle of Hanukkah. So, he got, the, the author, you know, really kind of goes on uh, about this point, and he, like, there's so much more, like, this whole book is fantastic, but um, that kind of just sums it up, and I wanted to ask if anyone on this chat knows what Maccabee stands for. Nobody? So Maccabee is an acronym. It stands for Mi Chamocha Ba'elim Hashem. Who is like you among the false gods, Hashem? And that that is kind of like the idea of Hanukkah is, is that Hashem really runs the whole world. Really, he really is the the real king, the king of kings. Like, well, it's not just a nice kind of cute thing. We call Hashem the king of kings. Like, it's real because to the Greeks, you know, they they only bow down to their gods, like their whatever, and their emperors were, were also seen as like kind of half-god, like, 
because anyone who would achieve that level of power must be like divine, right, in nature. But we say no, we say no, like they, we only, you know, as we say in Alenu, we only bow down to the Holy One, blessed be He. We don't, we don't bow down to any, any of these ideas, these vanities, right? And um, as we kind of touched on last week, like we don't have gods of the Greek times, right? Like we don't have statues of Zeus and temples of Athena and all this stuff anymore. But we do have like what the rabbi is saying in the book, these values of materialism, secularism, like technology, all these things. And that's not to say technology is bad, obviously. Like, I mean, we, we use light bulbs and I mean, light bulbs were invented by a non-Jew. So like, it's not, the point is not to just say like anything non-Jewish is, is bad, but it is to say that the nations of the world have, it's kind of like in their characteristic or like their, their personality, like something that defines the nations of the world is this sort of like rejection of, of Hashem. And um, this, is, this is what makes the Noahide path so praiseworthy. And that's why like what you're doing right now is such a big deal. Because it's, it's like not, it's almost like not natural. But it is, it's the most natural thing you can do. So what, it, what does it mean like who are you amongst all uh, false gods? It, it's saying really that what, what, what defines a Jew, and I guess like Noahides can be like roped in here because this has to do just with the oneness of Hashem and, you know, not uh, bowing down to idols or making idols. Uh, what, what does it mean, Michamoch Be'elim Hashem? Is that even though we have all these Avodah Zaras going, out, going on in the world, like Hashem still is like above that. Because we all exist in a world called whatever whatever Hashem wants to happen, right? <laughs> and that that includes all the Avodah Zarah, and that includes like everything, right? And the 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 merit the merit of the Maccabees was to say like we're not going to cower and we're not going to give up just because. Uh, Baderecha Teva, right? Like the the by the way of nature, we can't win, right? Like we're what, like a an army of a few hundred, I don't know, thousand of people. We're like an extremely outnumbered, right? Like we're trying to face the most powerful army uh, in that in the world at the time. Okay, so like what what like what? chance do they have they they don't stand a chance but they understand on, on a very deep level that what they're doing is the right thing and so they don't care like they they're like we're doing the right thing we know what we know we're we have Hashem on our side and it's like they just they knew that Hashem couldn't let them loose and and so that gave him the strength to to carry on and um in in order to like double down on that uh, not only did Hashem save them from the Greeks, like the Greek army in, in a physical way, but he also created the miracle of the oil, which was a, like a highlight or, or kind of like a, you know, a double down of, of the miracle of the war. They were both, they were both miraculous and they're both important. And there's a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion about why you know, like, why does the Gemara not mention the war? Why does al not mention the, you know, what, like, what is the book of Maccabees that doesn't mention the oil? What's the, yeah, the whole, that's a whole other, a whole other thing. But the, the message, the real message is, and for you, for Noahides, really, is, is to really attach yourself to the idea that you're doing the right thing. Um, and it's always the hardest now. And, and and that's why I kind of started out by saying started out the the share by saying like this it's hashkacha pratit that this is all happening now at this time because this is the message that that Noahides uh, need to hear uh, I think you know for Jews it's it's true it, it rings true but it's like this is we've heard this message every year you know like th this is the same message that we've 
kind of uh, taught and learned every single year for like the you know Jewish history. But for Noahides, this is a chiddush. Like th this is a novel idea for the secular world or for like the non-Jewish world. This is not like an idea that you grow up with. Uh, you know, this is not a kind of philosophy that is taught in public school, right? So it's almost like more of a, a miracle, I guess, if you want to say it that way, for, for a, a non-Jew, like, so, like someone who's just not like interested in conversion, who's just like, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to be a mensch here. Um, that, that's like more of a, of a chiddush, that's more of like a novelty, uh, because it's not, you wouldn't think, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't like assume. The flip side of that is you have to deal with more like schmutz because you don't, you're not in this like nice little insular community where you just talk to the same 10 people all the time and like they're from Jews. Like, no, you have to deal with this and you have to figure out like, how do I deal with people at work or like my family members and like, how do I deal with the gifts, the gift giving and like going to holiday things and like, this is all so very uh, difficult and you know, it's easy for me to say like, well, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to be Jewish so like I can't do these things, but it's more difficult when you're like, no, I just don't believe in this and like, I'm just trying to take it upon myself to like not lie to myself <laughs> and to God, but you know, that's that. So, ho you know, hopefully, you know, this, this message of Hanukkah gives you some, gives you some strength. Um, there was something else that I kind of wanted to touch on, but I, I just completely forgot. Um, is there any questions so far? Any like comments? Okay, that's okay. But I do want to bring one more thing, one more little part from the uh, the book here. Um, the rabbi says, where is it? Yeah, okay, so the rabbi says, in the sixth chapter of Exodus, sixth chapter of Exodus states that God replied to the cries of the Jews enslaved in Egypt, saying, and I have also heard the cry of the Jewish people. The Assam Sofer asks, what is the meaning of, and I also have heard? He then answers the question, explaining that a transformation had taken place among the Jews. They began caring about each other and performing acts of kindness for one another. Jews began hearing each other's cries and began, began praying for each other, and for the entire Jewish people. Most importantly, they stopped speaking Lashon Hara, harmful and hateful speech, one against the other. New camaraderie took hold and unity emerged. Only then did God respond to their prayers. Only when they heard each other's pleas and responded through exemplary behavior did God come to their assistance, saying, I too have heard their cries. And what, is this, what does this have to do with, like, Noahides? I think, I think this, like, also highlights the essence of the Noahide path, right? Because if you look at the Noahide laws, or, there really is only one positive commandment, which is to establish courts of law. But that's not a mitzvah in and of itself. That's only a mitzvah that depends on the other six, right? So what what does that mean? It's like, it's just like, what do you, it's not what you do, it's what you don't do. And the nature of these laws is pretty much like, uh, like, don't, don't burn the place down, right? <laughs> like, you know, Hashem's saying, like, I'm not expecting you to keep kosher. I'm not expecting you to keep Shabbos. I'm not expecting you to daven three times. I'm not, I'm literally not asking you to do anything. Just don't burn the place down. Like, don't, like, pillage, you know, murder, okay? Like, don't, right? Don't eat animals alive, you know? Like, please, get it for two seconds, right? So, like, that. what does that all have to do with, like, anything? Because these things, these things ruin society. <laughs> That's why... And, and it destroys the what what the rabbi here is, calls like camaraderie, and um, I mean this is kind of like a a very idealistic thing. But if you if you think about it, like all all war 
that we fight that is fought is about like uh, like either land, you know, land classic, um, n not just like uh, politically, but like financially, like economic, like uh, territory, like, oh, we need to like take over this land because because they have resources or they have like whatever, you know, but, the, but of course, there's also like political uh, advantage, like advantages um, or revenge, like maybe not so much in the modern in modern warfare, but certainly in history. Like, revenge, like, I need to avenge my father's legacy or whatever, so I'm going to war. Or, or uh, you know, uh, diff like, religion, religious wars, all these things. But the Noahide Code really, like, puts an end to all that. Kind of takes care of it in several different layers. Uh, primarily, like, the Avodah Zara thing. Like, if you just believe in one god, like, that makes it pretty easy. Um you know, stealing, a prohibition of stealing, uh, which kind of creates a right to private property, you have, like, a right, uh, to your life, like, your, your life and your property is protected, uh, by law, right, and because these laws come from God, and if, like, all Noahides have to believe in this, like, all Noahides have to believe, that they're, they're not just nice ideas, like, they come from God, they come from Moshe Rabbeinu, who received the Torah Mount Sinai, and because of that, that's why we have these Noahide laws, not just because they're nice, or because they make sense, because if you think about it, that's also like a, a slight form of a Vodazar, because you think, you think like, oh, well, like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm so smart that I could come up with these laws by myself, and like, maybe that's true, but what you're doing is you're basically putting the reason before the Torah and we learn it in like you know there's a deeper like mystical idea that the the Torah was was uh, or rather Hashem looked into the Torah and created the world basically so like the Torah preceded creation right so how can you say that the reason or like whatever benefit we derive from doing a mitzvah precedes the mitzvah. No, the mitzvah precedes the creation of the world. And then it just so happens that it's beneficial. You know, so like it's it's a little like change of of a, uh, a paradigm here, which is the Greek thing. Like that's the Greek thing is is like if if uh, I'll believe it when I see it, right? And and that too that applies too with with the mitzvahs. You know, and this is something that I've just, like, witnessed in, like, secular culture, even, like, secular Jewish culture, but also in secular, like, non-Jewish culture, that if it doesn't make sense, I'm not going to do it, right? Or, like, I'll, I'll pick and choose, like, when mitzvahs, you know, I follow. It's like, okay, congratulations, you know, whenever, whenever, like, you know, Hashem comes to you on top of a mountain and gives you the Torah, then, like, okay, maybe we'll talk, but, like, you know... What like, <laughs> like who made you Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Like, what? you know, so like we have to take the whole thing, and it, and it starts to just acknowledging like where it comes from. It comes from uh, Hashem, and it's like when you when you at least get to step one, you're already on a you're already on a good path because then you can't say like, ah, oh, well, I'm not going to do this because it doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Like, it doesn't have to make sense, you know, like. I, I don't remember where this is, but I remember reading a Rashi that, um, I don't remember where, I wish I could remember, but it said something along the lines of like, I'm, I'm saying it's a, it's a hook, like it's a mandate, like a statute, because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. Oops, I clicked something. I think it's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, basically it doesn't make sense. Uh, so I'm saying it's a hook because I'm saying it's a hook and you don't have the right to like question me because I'm God. <laughs> and like, that sounds like a very like archaic kind of like Christian way to put it. And I think, you know, if you think of like Rashi's environment, maybe that kind of makes sense. But um, it what really like the, the truth of it is that when you stop putting yourself before God, the mitzvahs start to make sense. Like, even the the ones that don't make sense. Just because you start to understand how this, like, connects you to Hashem. And this is, this is 
arguably more difficult by a Noahide because they all make sense. And it's like the best and worst part of it because it's easier on one hand because it makes sense, but then it's more difficult to do it lishma, like, w- like for its own sake because they make sense. So it's hard to separate your intellect from just like wanting to do it because, you know, Hashem said so. Because it's like, why would you want to murder? Why would you want to steal? Like, why would you want to do all these things? Like, you don't have those inclinations anyway, so it's not so much of a big deal. You know, but it comes down to, like, the smaller things. Like, um, you know, we all, you know, we have the opportunity to, like, uh, you know, someone gives us extra change or something. We have the opportunity to, like, take it and, like, we think, like, well, like, I don't make the rules here. Like, I don't make the exceptions here. I'm not doing this because it makes me feel good. Like, I'm not just not stealing because I want to feel better about myself. No, I'm not stealing because God said so. So when you think about it like that, and then you come into a situation where it's ambiguous, it's easier to err on the side of caution because you weren't even doing it for yourself anyway, right? And that that's the, I think that highlights the difference between, like, Greek culture and Jewish culture, like Jewish thinking, thinking like a Jew, is not saying like, I'll do X, Y, Z until like there is a minor inconvenience and then I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, it's like you you say, oh, I take the whole package, take the whole thing. And for a Jew, it's the same, like, uh, Sutrishna, if you're like converting, like, (laughs) you know, take, take the whole thing. And that, that, that's a huge derech, like a, it's a whole journey. Like you don't, you don't do that overnight, obviously, but but it's important to realize, like when, um, when you have these things and you're following a certain path and your your intention is to follow God, you have to follow it all the way, right? And and you have to, I guess non Jews it's a little different, but for Jews, like it's important to realize, like the the rabbanim, the rabbis of the you know of our, our sages of blessed memory have divine authority to tell us like how to keep the Torah and like what to do and so that's why you know we light the menorah the whole thing is rabbinic like there was there's no Pasuk in the Torah it says in you know Hanukkah like doesn't make sense Hanukkah happened like way after the the Torah was given so like why would it be in the Torah but <clears throat> the Rabbanim have the power to make this decree and say no we're gonna actually in- invent this whole new holiday because it is actually a a fulfillment of a of a mitzvah in the Torah to thank Hashem and praise Hashem for for miracles or for the goodness that He brings into our lives. So we are actually fulfilling a mitzvah in the Torah. It's just the the mitzvah in the Torah doesn't say light the menorah, it doesn't say do all this stuff. But it's the same by tefillin, right? The mitzvah of tefillin we say every day in the Shema. It says v'hayu letotafot benenecha. What like it shall be a uh, tota foot of between your eyes? Like what does that mean? There, the, that word never appears ever again, like in any other context in the Torah. So usually, like when we find a weird word in the Torah, we're like, okay, well, we'll like look at to see like wherever it comes up again, and then that's how we learn the context. Well, it, that that one you're just like out of luck because it doesn't exist. So. <laughs> You need the rabbis to tell you what that means, and there's like no way around it. And the same same goes for your holidays, like you know, uh, like Purim, uh, Hanukkah. You know, where where these are rabbinic holidays, but like, how do the rabbis have the authority to do this? Because they have the tradition passed down from rabbi to student, from rabbi to student, from rabbi to student, all the way back from Moshe Rabbeinu. So there's this unbroken chain of oral tradition, and that's how they know how to say. Like, the way we appreciate or the way we celebrate this miracle is like this. And, uh, yeah, so that's basically basically what I wanted to say. Any questions so far? Any comments, complaints? Well, if not, I'm done. That's all I wanted to say. Um, Hopefully this served as some chizuk, some... Uh, strengthening for you. Uh, Good luck during the holidays. As always, you can reach out to me. Um, 
if you need any help, any questions, you know, do it, do it up. All right, gang. Well, thanks for tuning in. Thank uh, you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Hopefully, you know, next week, God willing, same time, same place. Thank you, Ari. Yeah, the Thank you, Ari. All right. We'll be in touch. Good Shabbos.